Good evening, good evening, good evening. So thank you all so much for being here tonight for the Robert J. Schwartz Memorial Lecture. This, this lecture was established uh, by Ms. Gail Ross in memory of her late husband, uh, Robert J. Schwartz. Mr. Schwartz was actually a compassionate and dedicated member of the, for the former member of the Board of Trustees of the Wimber School, and we are so pleased to have the opportunity to honor him tonight. This annual lecture series connects researchers and educators, policymakers, and the broader educational community to increase access to current scientific advances in reading development instruction and to bridge, so importantly, the research to practice gap. Past lectures have included Hugh Cats in 2021, Richard Aslan in 2019, and Laurie Cutting in 2018. And I'm so excited to introduce this year's distinguished lecturer, Emily Solera, this year. I'm so sorry that we couldn't be here in person. And it's my hope, my wish, my desire, my dream that this be the last time we have to hold this lecture fully virtual. In the past two years, the world has changed. And while we will always have to have a virtual element to events like this because of our ma the massive reach this allows us to have, I do look so forward to seeing you all in person next year for this. And again, I wanna thank you so much for joining us. I know that many of you know the Windward School and the work we do, but for those who are, may not be as familiar, I wanted to provide a little bit of context. Our mission here at Windward is to serve students with language-based learning disabilities and to help them achieve their full potential. We do that through a couple of different ways. Our school program, which has campuses in White Plains and in Manhattan, where we serve about 970 students, but we know there are far more than 970 kids who get to walk through our door each day who need our help. So we also do a lot of an uh, additional work to that, including our teacher training work that impacts so many teachers across the nation and the globe. We have this community lecture series, this great read podcast through the Wimber Institute. And now that we've expanded our work and, and really established this Wimber Institute over the last three years, it's our, it's our work to expand uh, this work to even greater heights with the goal to increase childhood literacy rates by disrupting the status quo to save more educational status quo to save more lives. We had a little uh, research reception and, and the, the idea of disrupting came up over and over again. We're working to kind of put some really great work in, into the world and support literacy. The Wimbledon Institute sub directly supports the Wimbledon School and is committed to providing greater access to its expertise, its research, and on its and the, certainly on the proven ways that we remediate language-based learning disabilities. And it supports the Wimbledon School by providing professional development, partnering with leading educational institutions and other nonprofits that serve children, in addition to advocating for students with language-based learning disabilities. As a program, um, one of our values is commitment, and we live that value through the deep commitment to research. And we do that in partnership with great researchers like Dr. Solari. Um, and we certainly want to do that work to continue and to impact more students. And an event like this is certainly not an easy one to put together. And I do want to give a big special thank you to Sandy Schwartz, uh, Andy Stutz, uh, Annie Stutzman, Danielle Scarano, Naja Frazier, Harry Ramkishan and the rest of the WI team for all their great work to make tonight's, uh, tonight's live stream and, and, and Zoom meeting possible. I am so excited to introduce this year's Schwartz Lecture, which is about highlighting the importance of translating science and reading. And tonight's guest lecture has been a great friend to Winward, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Emily Solari. Emily is the coordinator and professor in reading, uh, reading education program at the Department of Curriculum Instruction and Special Education at the University of Virginia. She received her PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara in special education, uh, learning and disabilities and risk studies with an emphasis on human development. Dr. Solari's scholarship is focused on the prevalence and predictors of underlying and underlying mechanisms that drive reading development with the ultimate goal of developing and testing the efficacy of targeted interventions to prevent and, and to prevent uh, and reading, difficult, reading difficulties, if I can speak tonight, sorry. Her work has included intervention development trials with students who have early profiles of reading difficulties, individuals diagnosed with autism and early language uh, and English language learners. In addition to the work she's done on, on, on translating the science of reading by engaging practitioners and policymakers to leverage scientific evidence in improving practice in school settings. Currently, she's doing some research that involved testing the efficacy of evidence-aligned reading curricula with struggling first graders in multiple states, California, Virginia, Texas, to, to name a few. And she's also the PI of a, a pre-doctoral training grant funded by the Office of Special Education that will train future scholars and teacher educators in the science of reading and evidence-based reading assessment and instruction for students with disabilities. She also, in her spare time, serves as the, as the editor-in-chief in the, of the uh, Reading League Journal, 
It's a new journal dedicated to translating specific reading research findings for practitioners for the practitioner audience. She's also an associate direct editor for the Journal of Learning Disabilities and Remedial and Special Education. And she serves in various state and national level executive boards, including for the Council of Exceptional Children, their Division of Learning Disabilities and the Reading League, uh, League's Virginia chapter. So please welcome, uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Emily tonight and uh, for talking about translating reading uh, so, uh, translating um, reading research uh, to practice here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. I'm, I'm really very excited to be here tonight um, to share with you all some work that we've been doing recently um, that I've done over the course of many years. Um, and, you know, tonight I get to talk about my most favorite topic and coincidentally the one, the one thing I know a lot about and that's about reading development and reading education. Um, my work involves um, developing practitioners who understand the science behind how reading develops and how to implement that um, in authentic classroom settings, um, with particular attention to preparing teachers and uh, to be able to work with kids who are having reading difficulties. Um, one of the things that has really weighed heavily on me in the past five or so years, and particularly during this time that we've been in a global pandemic, is the role of the reading researcher in translating science into classrooms. Um, when I think about my work, I very much understand that the work that I do is only useful if teachers find it feasible to implement. Um, and also that they find it both effective and efficient in the context of their own classrooms. And I think there is a particular role that researchers play in making sure that this happens, but we have to do it very, very intentionally. We know that despite many scientific advances and reading science and understanding of how the brain, what is happening in the brain when kids learn how to read um, and what's happening when kids are having difficulties learning how to read, that that really hasn't made it as much as we would want into our classroom settings across the country. And so tonight I'm gonna to talk about this. I'm gonna talk about um, how we think about translational science, how we think about translational scientists, reading researchers, and what our, um, how we can move forward with translational science sort of guiding the practice, our practices. So before I, this is a lot of names, before I ever give a talk, I really, I think it's so very important to mention that nothing that I do, I do alone. All of my work is collaborative. Um, and I am the one who's here who gets the privilege of sharing with you what we do as a research group. But um, I am only as good as the people that surround me. It's, you know, and I just want to make sure that those people are recognized, including um, other faculty, my postdoctoral scholars that have worked with me over the years, graduate students, staff at the University of Virginia and University of California Davis, um, and then our undergraduate research assistants who are so very important to everything we do. And also I love that undergraduate research assistants, we sort of create a pipeline to reading research and also teachers. Um, and then of course, we can't do any work without our, the generous funding of um, donors and also um, uh, different federal and state agencies, so they should all be recognized as well. So I just want to start by a little bit by sort of contextualizing where we are. So we know, you know, if you are paying at all attention to reading in the United States, um, pre-pandemic, reading has been in the news. Um, there have been multiple stories, both local and at the national level, about reading, about what's going on with reading, um, really in, in thanks to some really, some journalists who have done, frankly, um, us a favor. They have brought this to the surface. They're talking about reading. They're talking about what's going wrong, what's going right, and how we could need to move forward as a field. Um, and so for a lot of folks like me and those of us who have dedicated our lives to ensuring that all children can learn how to read, this has been welcome. Um, we, you know, it's exciting to see that this work is being talked about, that there is um, more knowledge of what's going on um, across the nation in our schools. And then we also know that, you know, more recently there's been media coverage on um, 
what has been happening in the world of literacy since the onset of the pandemic. And so I don't think we can talk about translational science and reading without also acknowledging the pandemic and the impact that it's had on children in our schools. Um, the other thing that we know from this media coverage is that reading has been and continues to be controversial. In a lot of ways, in my work, I talk about this. Um, it has been unnecessarily controversial. Um, we most people know what the reading wars are. This, um, you know, for lack of a better term, disagreement to what is the best way, the most effective and efficient way to teach our youngest learners how to read. Um, and some of the topics that I have listed here, what we call the hot button issues in literacy. Um, and, you know, I think it's important that we engage on these topics. Um, when I think about the controversy in reading that I think is unnecessarily controversial, I think about um, where reading lives. And so, I, you know, it's really important to consider that reading education and reading development um, lives in both general education and special education. And it is it transcends both of these fields. And when we think about teachers of young children, both our general education teachers and our special education teachers need to be prepared in the same way to address, to teach children how to read and to address any sort of reading difficulty. And nobody has full ownership of reading. This is why it's kind of exciting. And also reading is huge. It is a foundational skill that impacts lifelong outcomes. So we need to be able to come together and have these conversations. And I, really, and I think it's really very important to point out that you would be very hard pressed to find an educator that doesn't want to teach kids how to read. Please find me that person and bring them to me because I do not think they exist. And so when we talk about the controversy in reading, I think we have to do it with the assumption that there is good intent um, and that we all want to be doing a really good job. We all want to teach um, kids how to read. That is the goal. And importantly, this controversy is not new. Um, in my doctoral uh, classes, I, in one of the ones that I teach around translational science and reading, and reading science, um, I often bring in this article from The Atlantic that talks about the reading wars. And it talks about it as an old disagreement. And this is based on what was happening in California. And then I asked them to look at the date. And if you look closely here, it says November 1997. And in November of 1997, the Atlantic was already calling this an old issue that has reemerged. And so in a lot of ways, we have gone through these cycles of what we call the reading wars with no real good solution. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how maybe we might be able to learn from what happened in the past to move us forward. So why is this so important? I do not think I need to spend a lot of time here. I do not need to convince this group that reading is just really very important for lifelong outcomes for kids. We know there's longitudinal data to show that it's related to lifelong outcomes. It has a really strong impact on overall academic achievement. It sets that foundation for later academic achievement for early and later academic achievement. It has an impact on economic well-being, health outcomes, social participation, and civic engagement. So we know that literacy is very important in the, in the, in the lives of individuals, um, all individuals. And we also know that early reading development in particular is very important to pay attention to. We know that first graders who have reading difficulties are 88% more likely to have difficulties in fourth grade. And we know that third graders who are not at proficient levels of reading are four times as likely to leave high school without a diploma. So I think it's really important to consider all of this context as we talk about reading science. And so what does the gen data generally tell us? And again, I cannot get into data from across the country right now. I don't have enough time. But the general data show us that for the general population of kids, on average, um, you know, about 40 percent, 30 to 40 percent of kids show some reading difficulties at some point in their academic career or trajectory. It's important to remember that this is um, you know, not always really, really severe. Um, some in this on a, you know, diff the different scales of difficulty or having difficulties with learning how to read. 
But we also know that for our historically marginalized subgroups of kids, and so these are kids who are maybe English as their, um, their second language, um, kids with disabilities, um, children of color, that it's more like 60% of kids um, demonstrate difficulties. And so I point this out because I would like to suggest that we're not really hitting it out of the park with our general population of readers. And the data are even worse for kids who have been historically mar marginalized and are currently marginalized in our school settings. And we need to pay attention to that. And this was all pre-COVID. So then we need to talk about what is the impact of COVID here. Um, I think this is important because when COVID hit, people who are concerned about outcomes for children who were concerned before, specifically in reading, became even more concerned. Because what happened was, is that children um, lost learning opportunities. They were just, those learning opportunities were disrupted. And we knew that that was going to have an impact on outcomes for kids and their reading development. In particular, kids are youngest learners. So um, I, you know, I have a child that was in kindergarten when COVID hit. And so he left school in March of 2020 and really did not go back into uh, in-person setting until fall of 2020. 21. And we know from reading data longitudinally and developmental data that that kindergarten and first grade year are so very important for developing literacy skills. So I'm presenting to you some data that we have at, in, at University of Virginia um, that is state level data in Virginia. I'm not going to go deep into this because I can't. But really, I'm just here to show you that if you consider the proportion of children who are who were screening as at risk pre and post pandemic, it has risen, it has grown significantly. So that's important to know. And the second really important thing to know is that um, the, 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 imp the impact of the pandemic appears to be differentially negative on particular subgroups of children, children of color, English learners, and those with disabilities. And this is from kindergarten through second grade. So I think we really need to think about that when we're talking about um, translating science, um, translating reading science into classrooms. What is our response? What are we doing now and how can we come up with recovery plans? So, um, and I think, you know, this should not be surprising to people who are here for this talk. Um, we're all familiar with what has happened in the educational system. I mean, in a lot of ways, sort of these inequities that were below the surface um, before COVID really came to light during COVID. Um, and this is not to say that there have not been amazing efforts by teachers because there have been amazing efforts by teachers, um, but we just had kids that have been differentially impacted. These data, I'm just gonna talk through really briefly. Um, and so basically what we have here is we're looking at data um, kindergarten, first and second grade. Um, and we're just looking at the most at-risk kids in the data set in Virginia. So on the left-hand side in kindergarten, you have data from 2018, 2019, which is pre-pandemic. And then on the right-hand side, under the kindergarten side, and for all first and second grade, you have a data from 2020, 2021 school year. And so if you just pull out the kids who scored below benchmark at fall, and then looked at how they were doing at spring. So did they get out of that below benchmark rate range or not? What you see is that pre-pandemic in kindergarten, first and second grade, so the left column in each of these, in kindergarten, 50% of kids still remained at risk at the end of the kindergarten year, 73% in first grade and 70% in second grade. And so what that suggests is that even when these kids are being screened as highly at risk, they're not receiving adequate instruction in order to get out of that risk profile. And we know that's so important in the early grades. And then during the pandemic, we just saw an increase and a significant increase in these groups who were not responding um, to instruction. And that could be for multiple reasons. One is which, you know, kids had reduced instructional time. And a lot of the time, and a lot of some instruction was on, um, was on Zoom and it's very, really very hard to teach reading on Zoom. Um, so I, the other context thing here is that we are living in a world where there are many, many states, and I think most people are um, aware of this, that have passed dyslexia and literacy legislation. 
Um, this is happening across the country. Um, you know, almost every single state has some sort of new-ish literacy law, and most states have screening laws that have been put in place so that we're screening early um, for reading difficulties. And I think that this is exciting, right? So we have states that are starting to pay attention to this um, and trying to implement good policy um, for how we address these broad issues around reading development and achievement. Um, so all this is context to sort of point out that we're living in, in a very interesting time. Reading is a hot topic. Laws are being passed in order to improve reading trajectories for children, all which have very good intentions. Um, good laws, good legislation addresses the needs of multiple stakeholder groups, including schools, teachers, districts, and families, and many more. But we also need to understand that literacy legislation is only as good as its implementation. And this is true at the state level, at the district level, and at the school level. You can have the best plan, but implementation is what's really very important. I think that's where we can learn from translational science and translational scientists. So the reality is, is that we know a whole lot. We really do know a whole lot about how reading develops. We know a lot less about how we can effectively and efficiently implement these practices in school settings. Um, and there are many factors to consider when we're thinking about this. So tonight, this evening, I'm going to talk about the science of reading. This is, you know, sort of a, another hot button topic. What is the science of reading? What is it not? Um, what is the evidence base that we have for early reading development? And then I'm going to go a little bit into the multiple levers that are necessary to improve literacy and reading outcomes. Um, this is not there, you know, spoiler alert, there's no silver bullet here. Things have to be happening simultaneously in order for us to see real change in reading trajectories. And then going into bridging the gap, the research to practice gap through translational science. So what are some things that we kind of know and what are some things that we can um, move forward sort of understanding that we have a solid evidence base? So reading science tells us that there's a, converge, there's a converging evidence from multiple fields of study over decades that has established a scientific evidence base for how children learn how to read and why some, children's, some children have difficulties learning how to read. Reading science or science of reading also explains how reading develops both neurologically and also behaviorally. That's important, so both. And why some struggle to learn how to read and write. Um, and it's a, it's a solid evidence base. And so this one, when I talk about the reading wars being controversial, this is why it seems controversial, be, uh, unnecessarily controversial, because we do have a strong and solid scientific evidence base. And we can take this evidence base of what we know, how reading develops and why some kids have difficulty to inform our early reading practices. And we need, we ought to be doing that um, to prevent later reading difficulties. So what does the science of reading tell us about how early reading, about early reading development? So we know that reading is not the same as language development. It's not a natural process. Um, you know, I, unfortunately, in the way in which we train some teachers across the country, um, it is often, it is sometimes presented as a natural process. You immerse children in books and they're gonna learn how to read. Very similar to if you have high quality interactions with young children, they most develop language. Um, and we know that this is not how early reading develops. Um, we know that when um, individuals are skilled readers, so the folks in the room that are highly skilled readers, you read so quickly you don't know you don't know what's going on you're reading very very quickly but but ultimately we are attending to different led to the letters in the words it's just when you're an efficient reader you don't know that you're doing that and so when you think about that from an instructional lens if we know that that is what needs to happen in order for kids to learn how to read we ought to be teaching that that explicit connection between letter names and letter sounds um, we know that explicit, there's a behavioral studies that show that explicit and systematic instruction of foundational reading skills, so phonics, phonological awareness, um, with simultaneous high quality language and meaning based instruction. So doing those foundational skills in tandem with high um, quality oral language development 
and uh, and engagement with rich text text is what um, is going to work. It is what works for developing reading comprehension, and we know it requires both of these things. So there's something called the simple view of reading, which I'm sure many folks on this. Um, are, are familiar with. And it basically says that decoding linguistic comprehension, we need both of those things in order for kids to um, be able to comprehend what they read. Um, linguistic comprehension referring to oral language development, understanding text orally, and decoding related to the ability to read words efficiently, um, autom automatically, and fluently. It's called the simple view of reading. I actually hate that name. And I, I hate that name because it's just not very simplistic. And so I think sometimes people, oh, it's simple view of reading, we got this. Well, no, there's a lot of subcomponent skills under decoding um, and, lingu and linguistic comprehension that are really important for the development of those broader skills that we know are important for the development of reading comprehension. Um, but the really interesting thing and what I like to get um, folks excited about is that knowing what those subskills are that sort of feed into decoding and encoding linguistic comprehension is really very important because when you think about this from an instructional lens, those should be teaching targets for our youngest readers. And then we also know that, you know, um, fluency is important. So reading fluency is really very important. And we know fluency is related to prosody, accuracy of rate. And when I talk about fluency, I am reading, I am talking about reading connected text. So being able to read a paragraph with fluency. Um, and there's been, the other thing about the simple view of reading, which is really very important, is that it's a framework that has been empirically validated hundred, many, many, many times, and also empirically validated with diverse learners, diverse subgroups of kids. So, um, you know, in my work, I have um, looked at reading development example, for example, for kids with who are English learners and have been able to replicate some findings around how the decoding and listening comprehension feed into reading comprehension for that particular sample. Same for kids with autism and then those kids with early profiles of reading risk. Um, so this is important to know that it's not just a framework, it's empirically validated um, with multiple subgroups of kids. And then we also know that there are profiles of readers um, who have reading difficulty and that it's not a small group of kids and that kids can have different types of reading difficulties. Um, and so when we think about how we are training teachers and how we are working with in-service teachers, we need them to know this. Um, we need them to see themselves as um, you know, detectives, essentially, if they are presented with a child who is having a reading difficulty, it is their responsibility to find out why and where is the bottleneck for that particular child um, or go to resources around them to help the, you, them find out what's going on with that particular child. So I've talked a lot about um, reading development and some stuff related to what we know sort of quantitatively about kids and reading development, all very important. But I also wanna point out that like kids learn how to read, not brains. And I and this it's maybe sort of a, a weird way to say it, but like kids, are growing up in very heterogeneous contexts. They are exposed to different early childhood experiences. They are exposed to different classroom environments and different instructional opportunities. They have different resources. Um, and all of these things play a factor in the reading development of young children. There are certain things that we can control and there are certain things that we cannot. And I would argue that it is the burden and the responsibility of educators and stakeholders who are interested in reading development to make sure we are really attending to those things that we can control. One of the, the biggest example of this is instruction. We can make decisions for children about how we're teaching them to read um, that is based in evidence and science. Um, and so I just really encourage folks to think about that um, as, as you think about your engagement with kids around reading development. 
So what are some other things that we kind of know about the science? We know that early identification instruction is important. This may sound silly, but it's, it is very, really very important. Um, I think folks may have shared this article that we wrote um, for the Reading League, where we did just a sort of really a very brief synthesis, really meant for translation to practitioners. This article is meant so that practitioners can pick it up and sort of understand sort of the solid evidence base around um, early reading instruction and why it's so important. Um, so we know that early reading difficulties lead to later re reading difficulties. We know that reading difficulties, can be, reading difficulties can be greatly reduced when students receive adequate evidence-based instruction. Um, and we know that early reading intervention is more effective than later reading intervention. I don't want anyone to leave here thinking that if a child is in fourth or fifth or sixth grade, if they can't read um, accurately, that, um, that they are um, a lost cause. That is not what I'm saying. I'm just, we, there's just data to support, uh, to show that it, just, it takes a longer time to um, work with the child who's in fourth or fifth grade who's having severe reading difficulties um, as compared to a kindergartner in first grade. So when we think about what we call tiered approach, um, a tiered approach to services for, for children in, in reading, um, uh, we really want to make sure that the instruction across all tiers, so tier one being our general education instruction, tier two being supplemental instruction for children who display a profile of reading risk, and tier three more intensive interventions for kids who um, have significant reading difficulties, that instruction needs to be aligned and it needs to be ex explicit, systematic, and cumulative um, across all three tiers. And when you're thinking about tier two and tier three, something that's really important to think about is how it's targeted and the dosage. So when I, we go back to what I said before, um, teachers and education professionals need to see themselves as detectives. If they have a child who has a reading difficulty, you need to assess that child, both on decoding and our linguistic comprehension and oral language to determine what the bottleneck is. And your instruction should be targeted to that. And it needs to be done with appropriate dosage. So we know that dosage, intensity, and, con and the content of instruction is important. So this is some work that I um, have done over the years. This particular study took place in California and Texas, and I'll give you a little bit of context here. Um, we got a, we did a randomized controlled trial in first grade classrooms, uh, again, across California and Texas, where we went in to the general education setting, and we were asking teachers to implement small group targeted instruction for the kids that were identified as the most at risk in the classroom. And so basically we wanted to know like, can we, can, can first grade teachers, our general education teachers do this work? Because I had a firm belief that they could do this work. Um, and before it, you know, maybe gets passed on to a reading specialist or a special education teacher, um, can we prevent reading difficulties early in the context of um, the general education classroom. And I do want to let folks know that um, we did a lot of work with these teachers. They received um, multiple sessions of professional development. They had video exemplars, exemplars of like what evidence-based instruction looks like. We provided them with scripted lessons that they implemented both in the whole group and the small group with the, with the most at-risk kids. Um, so it was a tier one and a tier two intervention because we needed to make sure that that tier one instruction was also evidence-based. Um, and they had access to a coach who would come in and watch them um, do their instruction, provide feedback, and then who was just a trusted source um, of knowledge for that teacher um, because we were asking them to, in some cases, 
fundamentally change their practice. And when you're asking teachers to do that, you need to provide them a lot of support. And I tell you all this because there are many districts and schools across the country who are trying to move toward changing practice. And it, this is a very important step for many children across this country. Um, but we should not kid ourselves and think that this, this is a quick fix. This is something that takes a lot of professional development and coaching. And so what I want to show you is about dosage right now. And I am happy to talk about this studies more. And there's a couple of different papers um, published on it so you can get some more information. But after the study was over, we found generally good effects. Our kids who were the most at risk, who were getting that supplemental instruction, they showed growth. And in a lot of their, um, on average, they um, were showing some growth and in some cases were catching up to the kids who were not identified as at risk. So, um, but we wanted to know like, what's the impact of dosage here? And this sounds silly, because of course, I'm like, yes, Emily, dosage is important. Of course it's important. Kids who get more instruction are gonna do better. Yes, that's true. But what we did was we collected data um, at the individual child level. So if they were present that day, um, we knew, and if they were not, so we knew exactly how many hours of instruction these children had got on top of their core instruction. And basically what we did was we looked across the no treatment group or the kids who were in the control group, so the blue group here, and then 20, 40, and 60 sessions to really see like at what point are kids quote unquote catching up to the kids who were not originally at risk. And it looks like that's between about 40 and 50 sessions administered by the first grade teacher in um, a general education setting. And I, yes, th that's a large ask. And so if you consider the average score here, this is a scale score of 10 for both of these measures. Um, we were seeing growth and between 40 and 50 measures, um, 40, 50 sessions, there was some growth that sort of put the, those students in line with kids who are not at risk. And that was true for both word reading and also linguistic comprehension, which I think is important because often, you know, uh, we, we concentrate really very heavily on foundational skills in the early grades, which is very important. And we maybe don't do as much work on listening comprehension, oral language and linguistic comprehension, but ours targeted both on purpose because we know from the simple view that we need to develop both sides. So what? So we know that improvements in classroom instruction can reap rewards. And I just put this up here because I also don't want folks to leave here say, with anyone thinking that I'm saying that the only thing that's important in early learning instruction is phonics and foundational skills. Those have to be core. They have to be explicitly taught. But we also have to think about um, learning new words and vocabulary, under, understanding text and different genre of data, genre of uh, text, and building background knowledge for children in a high, in a with high quality instruction materials in the in the early grades. So the other thing that I think is important to talk about um, within the context of early reading difficulties is we know that we cannot perfectly detect who will have reading difficulties. We certainly know that we're getting better at it. Um, the science of this has evolved over the last few years, um, but, but it's, not, it's not a perfect science, just like any screening measure is not a perfect science. I think likely in the era of the pandemic, we've kind of learned a little bit more about screening and what that means and positives and false positives. And um, so we, you know, we need to think about this in the context of how we administer our instruction. And so just bear with me here for a minute as I walk through this. So this is a normal, a normal curve. Um, and um, on a normal curve, you have an average score, which is represented by the green lines, and you have kids who perform um, across that curve, right? And so this is actually one of the most difficult things for classroom teachers. When their kids arrive in the fall or whenever their school year starts, um, they have a heterogeneous group of kids and they have different abilities, different strengths, different weaknesses. Um, and we are expecting classroom teachers to address um, the reading needs of the entire classroom. And that is not a small task. We also know that we um, screen kids, right? Because we really want to know who are the most at-risk kids. Who are the kids that are far below benchmark and may need extra instruction? And so typically we set up 
some sort of cut point wherein you're at risk or not. That's the easiest way and the way that most divisions and schools and districts do this. Um, and so we identify the, the yellow circle are the kids who are at most risk and need extra instruction. And then we have the kids that might be just above that risk point um, who maybe aren't doing as poorly as the kids um, that screen below benchmark, but they also might not be doing that great. And they may still also be at risk for late reading difficulties. And I go through this because I think it's important to point out a couple of things. One, it's not a perfect science. And so when you think about that, when you think about the context of core instruction, so tier one core instruction, general education instruction and school settings, um, if, if it's not a perfect science to identify kids who have reading difficulties, it makes that core instruction that much more important. And it's that much more important because for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that every kid has to have access to explicit and systematic instruction of foundational skills in their course setting. Um, because if they're not identified as the kid who has a reading difficulties, but they aren't doing maybe as well as other kids or they're, they're just above that cut point, they need access to that instruction. Um, and also for the kids who really are, have, are at the most risk, we know that dosage is important, right? So they need that core instruction that's explicit, systematic, and cumulative. And then they likely need more instruction. They need more time engaging in those tasks in tier two or tier three. So it's important for all the kids in the classroom that the core instruction is evidence-based. Um, or else, you know, for every single child across that classroom setting. So I'm going to jump a little bit into what are the multiple levers and there's no silver bullet. So this is like my most favorite question that I get from people um, all the time. Emily, what is the one thing you would change <laughs> about literacy instruction or reading instruction to um, sort of move the needle? And I don't think I've ever publicly answered that question because I actively resist that question. And the reason why I actively resist that question is because there is no silver bullet here, right? And there has to be multiple things moved at the same time in order for us to, to move the needle on literacy. Um, and it's at multiple levels and there's multiple layers of what needs to happen. The other thing I get asked all the time is, um, Okay, so you've convinced me that we just know a lot about reading because we do. We, there's reading science, we know how reading develops, we know what ought to be done with kids, but what? where's the missing link? Where is the missing link between what we are learning in our research settings and what is happening in schools? And I would suggest that there are multiple missing links. Um, and part of that is our own internal conversations within universities. So yes, I'm gonna throw my own folks under the bus here a little bit. Um, because, you know, within the university setting, there's actually very little incentive and to collaborate with folks that may be outside of your particular area. And so, and so why that's problematic is because reading science happens in multiple disciplines in multiple fields. And if we're not talking to each other, if I'm not talking to the neuroscientists and the cognitive scientists and folks in psychology, then I'm not serving my teacher education candidates in the way that I ought to be. Because I need to be paying attention to what is the emerging science in those fields. Um, and then also we have a translation problem or a bridge, you know, a research practice divide in how we communicate our science to schools and importantly, allow for feedback from schools to the work that we're doing at the university. Because like I said before, we have to make sure that what we're doing is feasible, efficient and effective for teachers. So I wrote about this a little bit in um, an op-ed that came out, I don't know, oh yeah, June 2020. So height of the pandemic. Um, because I become increasingly convinced that there's no silver bullet and, and um, we really have to hit on these multiple levers simultaneously. And that includes how we're preparing teachers, that we're ensuring there's adequate screening measures in schools, that teachers have access to evidence-based curricula and instructional materials. We can train teachers about reading science. We can train the why. Um, we can train how you do it, but if they don't have what they need at their fingertips in 
a classroom study to implement explicit and systematic instruction, um, they have a really hard time doing that. And you can understand why. If you don't have the tools you need to do your job, it becomes very, very difficult to do your job. Um, we need to make sure that we are providing professional development of both teachers and administrators. Um, folks who work inside of the school setting know that administrators play a very, very important and essential role in this process and change process within schools. Um, they lead the school and they set the tone and the culture for the school. And so if we're making big changes in reading, we, principals and other building level leaders do need to be on board. We need to think about our alignment of teacher certification and expectations of practicing teachers, and then really consider our parents as partners in this process. Um, and this is really, really very important. Every time I engage with a parent around reading, I learn something. Um, and I, you know, I think that that it's important to make sure we're listening to parents about their experience with their children in schools. So what is the role of translational science in this process? So again, thinking about this bridging the university to school and school back to the university. Um, I had, frankly, the pleasure, absolute pleasure of working with um, many reading scholars across the country when um, it was the height of the pandemic. And I remember being on the phone with one of my colleagues and I said, I don't know, like we need to think about this. There's a lot of stuff happening. It's a global pandemic, kids aren't in school. We were already worried about reading. What is the roadmap here? How do we really think critically about translating our science into classroom practices? Um, and so I wanna be really very clear that this is not my work alone. This is absolutely a collaboration across multiple fields. Um, and so I just to like honor all of those folks who have worked on, who worked on this paper and then who I continue to engage with on different things around translational science. So we came up with a few different things, like what is the roadmap? How can translational science inform this issue of research to practice, this really important issue of research to practice? So we thought, thought of a few different things, which I'm gonna go into a little bit, each of them a little bit deep, more deeply. So translational science team. So what does it mean to have a functioning translational science team of folks who have um, come from multiple different disciplines um, and also have, um, different strengths and their ability to do science um, and translate science and communicate science to the field. Um, we also talked about the importance of cultivating translational scientists. So what does this mean? This means developing the next generation of scientists who really understand how to engage practitioners in this process in a mutually beneficial way. Um, I think there's a lot of concern and it's, it's warranted that when researchers come into school settings, it's not often mutually beneficial. It's, it's often beneficial for the researcher and less beneficial for teachers, administrators, and children. Um, and we need to make sure that we are cultivating folks who know how to engage properly with schools in a way that's mutually beneficial. And then thinking about how we can think about public engagement. Um, I will say that I think scientists and academics are historically terrible at translating and talking about their science, about communicating their science. Um, this is actually really not something unless you, you learn how to do as a graduate student. Um, we learn how to do rigorous science, we learn how to do methods. We don't learn necessarily how to translate that science and have public engagement around findings that can change trajectories for kids. So how do we sort of do that and think about that as a group? And then collective communication around a single shared problem. And in this particular situation, the single shared problem is that we are not teaching all children how to read. And there are certain subgroups of kids who are differentially impacted by this. And we should be paying attention. We need to do something about it. So back to the idea of translational science teams. And this, it was, um, came from, this was in our particular um, paper, but came from a previous paper with my colleagues, which I'm happy to share if that's useful, but really thinking about, often we think about translational scientists, but not the team, not a translational science team. And reading is so 
big. It, you know, it touches so many different spaces that um, what, what this group was thinking about was like, how do you create teams that function together to um, think about this single shared problem, right? Um, understanding that every team member has different strengths and weaknesses, and this is a collaboration between multiple fields. And what do we mean by the translational science process and reading science? So I'm gonna go a little bit here. Um, for those of you who are familiar, this is adapted from medical fields um, where we think about sort of this um, bench to bedside. Uh, how, do you move, how do you move what you learn in lab science to actual practice with humans? <laughs> Which by the way, is difficult to do, um, particularly in the context of reading. So why do we care about this? And why do we care about implementation of scientifically based reading instruction? What is the role of translational science? So first and foremost, I think it's really important to recognize that this process is evolving and it's not perfect and it's not linear. Um, so when we think about applying basic science to the field, there's a whole lot of steps in between what we learn from maybe a neuroscientist to what's happening to a child every single day in the classroom. You can't take a lab finding and expect teachers to digest that and then implement practices based on what was happening, right? And if you run into anybody, any thought leader or someone out there who says that this is how this process should happen, I would definitely question that. Um, so how do we get from basic science findings, which are extremely important, for reading science and, and, and can inform and should inform what we're doing in classrooms to the classroom setting and what's actually happening for kids every day. So basic science, um, I think, you know, most folks are aware of basic science or stuff that's happening maybe in neuroscience or perhaps people are investigating the way the brain works or what's happening when children engage with, um, with text. Um, you know, that's what we kind of consider our, our basic science. Our preclinical research studies are studies that, um, you know, in, in the reading world, these are studies where we're sort of thinking about how do we take the basic science to inform the development of maybe assessments or instructional protocols um, and sort of pilot and test those things out. We then move into um, clinical research studies um, where, we use knowledge from the basic science and the preclinical research studies to test things, uh, what we sometimes call efficacy studies, um, where we are testing things with particular groups of kids. So we, and, we, and there's typically um, some uh, treatment and control group. So what I talked to you about before, when we went into classrooms, first grade classrooms, we trained teachers up and we asked them to implement a trial, they implemented a protocol with kids and we tested efficacy for a small group of kids, uh, um, uh, you know, a particular group of children to see if it works. The next step, um, you know, is study in maybe more larger real world settings with more diverse populations um, and uh, kids, you know, working, sort of beefing up these trials and also really, really understanding in this step and the studies and rural settings, um, for whom and under what conditions do things work? And I think this is a really big question in education research. Um, when we think about things like replication of findings, um, just because something has been implemented in one particular context with maybe a narrow group of children, it does not mean that you can take that thing, replicate it exactly, and it's going to work with the next group of kids because context matters. And children learn how to read, not brain. So the experience of the children in the study matters. Um, so thinking about what are the different um, active ingredients that are the most essential and most important to implementation is really very important in how we translate our science. Um, and then at engagement with communities and teachers with that feedback loop back to the research about what's happening, what's working, what's not, why isn't it working? All really very important if we want to move to the next level, which is studies at scale. Um, so these are more population level studies where we use investigating that's a widespread use of a particular method. 
So I want a couple of comments here. Um, I want to be really clear that science is never clean. I know we want to think science is clean, but science with humans and behaviors and reading development is not that clean. It's it there. There's um, when you move from a lab setting to a classroom setting, there are just so many different things going on, so many variables happening that you have to attend to or frankly decide that you can't attend to certain ones um, to understand the mechanisms that are making things work or not work and you have to pay attention to both. And so this is really um, very complex. And I think, you know, importantly in reading science, there are certain things that have been through this process that we know a lot about. And I would argue that one of those things is how you teach children to decode. So how you teach children how to read individual words. Um, we know a lot about that. And, but what's not happening is we're not seeing it happen at scale. The, the efficient, effective and evidence-based methods that we know are important um, are not necessarily making it to the classroom setting. So, you know, my sort of thought on this is we ought to be putting the things that we know a lot about into classrooms now, while simultaneously going through this process and investigating things that we don't know as much about. Um, and we need to be very honest with teachers about what we know and what we don't know. Perhaps it's more important to be honest with teachers and educators about what we don't know yet. Okay. So how can we move forward with translational science as a guide? Um, I think that there's feedback for my colleagues, reading scientists and reading researchers and literacy researchers that, that are important about how we engage with the community and then also for the fields. I'm gonna go through both of those. Um, so I think I'm gonna go through each of these a little bit, but briefly, we have to be willing to engage and engage often. We have to engage often with stakeholders. Um, we need to develop new, new scholars that understand the bridge between the research and practice divide. I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, we need to have research pro pro projects when we are at the phase where we are in schools that are true partnerships with our communities around us. We need to have research samples that are diverse. And we need to learn how to communicate our science better. So engagement. Um, uh, Engagement can be hard. It can be particularly hard for reading researchers um, because, you know, I think sometimes we um, uh, think that um, our work is being read by people, and I guarantee you it's not being read by the masses um, and our, our academic or our academic publications. Um, and so we have to learn how to engage with lots of different groups of people. Um, one of the things that I did when I moved to University of Virginia three and a half years ago is I just said yes to conversations. And so, I, you know, and I think I have learned so much from that experience. I have had so many conversations with parents, with administrators, with teachers, with policymakers, community members um, that I have I've learned from this and it's also changed the way in which I approach my research in schools. And so I think we have to be willing to engage, engage early, engage often and engage authentically. Our research practice partners, so what we, there are folks who do so much more work in this space than me, um, but I want to point out that this is a really important piece here. We have to have long-term mutually beneficial partnerships with folks. The people who are doing research need a feedback loop from their communities that they are working in. Um, I could make the most beautiful, you know, teacher uh, intervention, the student intervention, teacher intervention, whatever it is, but if it's not feasible for teachers to implement, it's never going to have an impact. And so that feedback loop is really very important. Um, we need to promote rigorous research in the context of school classrooms that um, investigate problems of practice and implementation. Um, again, this sort of piece about for whom does it work and under what conditions, um, as we can't just assume that something that works in one place is going to be plopped into another place and it's going to work. It's not like that all the time. And these research practitioner partnerships, um, they have a potential to improve the relevance of our research findings. And also um, they're, it, 
they're more likely to create sustainable change, um, which I think is so important because, you know, I think researchers probably rightfully get a bad rap where we, you know, often go into schools, we do a project and then we leave. And if you're in research, I think the reading scientists need to be dedicated to making sure that before we leave, that um, we have developed a sustainable model with it, within that school, within that system that um, teachers and administrators can continue to implement if, if there's efficacy in what's being done. Developing new scholars, I talked about this a little bit, so I'll go over it pretty quickly, but um, we need to develop scholars who see their lens through translate, translational science, who value interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary collaboration. And I'll be honest, it is much harder to do research when you're doing interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research. Um, but I will say that it's much, I think it's much more beneficial for the field and for kids. Um, when you have multiple minds at the table who have different a different take on what's happening in the school system and what needs to be done, um, those often lead to better outcomes and, and, and for kids and better programs that are more sustainable for kids. Um, and then, who also we need to train our doc students to be able to communicate their science <laughs> in a way that maybe perhaps some people in my generation were not trained to do. So inclusion of diverse learners and communities. So our sampling methods um, need to be intentional about the inclusion of diverse samples. I mean, there's been national level media recently on, wait, is the science of reading really for English learners? Is there an evidence base there? There are studies there. I've done some of the work myself. Um, but, you know, when folks speak out and they're from particular, you know, different groups of people across this country um, and in different countries, when they say, wait, is this, is this, is this for our kids? Um, we need to listen to those people and we need to engage authentically with those groups of people around the science and what it means. And we also need to be much, much more intentional in testing out whether or not um, things were, how things work under which room and in what conditions with diverse samples. Um, so we have to be really um, intentional about that sampling. I encourage folks to do that. And then I'm gonna hit, I've said this three times, four times, but the communication of our science to the public. We need to develop better strategies for communication, different avenues for communication. How are teachers learning about science right now and reading science? Go to those places, talk to those people. And we need to make sure that we're speaking to broad and diverse educational stakeholder groups. So what are the implications for the field and we, the things that likely need to happen as we move forward? I, you know, I say this in the context of um, understanding what we know and do not know about reading instruction, really very important. We are in a pandemic. Um, children have lost instructional time. Um, the data indicates, indicates that this has impacted kids, that they are, um, we have lower levels of literacy across grade levels. Um, and so what is the response to that and how do we sort of move forward with the knowledge that we know, implement that now while we're simultaneously um, researching other things, you know, because this is it, research evolves. So you need to, we need to take a really critical look at our literacy practices. Um, and that includes our data, our curriculum, our professional development, and the support infrastructure. A lot of people talk about the tiered approach to services and how um, you, how we, you know, sort of have a certain percentage of kids in core instruction, supplemental, and um, a certain percentage in tier three or intensive instruction. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing now more than ever, it was certainly happening before the pandemic is sort of a flipped model wherein the majority in kids of kids in some places are scoring below benchmark um, and need supplemental instruction. And so what I would say to you is that if you are in a school or a division or district or a region that has this sort of flipped model, you have a core instruction issue to deal with. Um, we should not be identifying 40 to 50 to 6% of kids as with having reading risks. We just should not. And when you have a functioning core, when you have a functioning core instruction that's explicit, systematic, and cumulative, um, you at that point, if those if the, if the majority of kids are getting that instruction, that you know, uh, the evidence-based instruction, you're less likely to have um, false positives into the kids who for kids who have risk. 
So we talked about this a little bit earlier this evening in a, in a different setting, but I really want to encourage folks to avoid the pile on. And I, I want to try to explain what I mean here. Um, again, there are many districts and divisions and regions across the country that have good intent. They are trying to change practice. Um, and that, that what really matters here is implementation. And so what I have seen time and time again that I would encourage people to think about is the sort of pile on for teachers. And what I mean by that is we cannot come into a school system or to a classroom and just say, okay, so we're still going to move forward with our curriculum that we've been using for a long time that, you know, may, may, is like, might not be effective for kids. And then we're going to add in some phonics and we're going to add in some font, you know, some phonemic awareness. We're going to add in these other things and we're going to do all these things at once. Um, there is good intent there. This is not bad intent. But what it does is it confuses teachers and it also confuses students. Um, and then what happens is, is, you know, over time, maybe we implement these things for a couple of years. Um, and then we have teachers that say, well, you know, we did try the phonics thing and it didn't work. And the reason why it didn't work really is because it, we didn't ask for sort of a fundamental shift in the way that we are teaching and reading in our core instruction. So the foundational skills are vitally important and it has to be a core part, an essential component of your instruction. And it has to be explicit and systematic and cumulative. We cannot say, expect kids to know how to sound out words if we're not teaching them how to do that process explicitly. And it has to happen alongside um, high quality interactions with text and oral language development. So I think sometimes people call this maybe the band-aid approach or the pile on. I call it the pile on because I, it stresses teachers out um, as it should. Um, and, you know, teachers are often in these situations where we're not teaching them, treating them as the professionals that they are. And we need to make sure that we're respecting them and their time and their knowledge um, and helping them understand the why and the how of what we're doing, what we're changing, and also what we're not doing anymore. This is really important. So um, you can sort of put in a phonics program. But if we're still engaging in those act, those teaching early literacy teaching skills that are not aligned with science and not evidence based, um, that's problematic for teachers. It's confusing and it's really very confusing for students. So the other thing I want to say for the field is follow science, not people. I, I um, have been troubled by this recently. Um, science of reading is a ro robust body of knowledge um, that is informed by multiple fields of study. And I think we are in danger of veering away from science if we are following individual people and not scientific findings. Um, so I just want to encourage folks to make sure that you're engaging with research findings. If you can engage with scholars around this, but let's follow the body of research not particular um, groups or people. And, you know, I think, again, people come to the table with good intent. Um, and sometimes we want, um, you know, what is sort of, who's the most, what's the loudest voice in the room or who's the person who we sort of see the most on social media and what's sort of going on there. And I think we need to be really very careful because um, if we think about whole language and we think about balanced literacy, that really was a following of people and not science. And we need to make sure that we don't um, make that mistake again. And then one, the last thing is allowing for course correction. So science is always evolving. And this is actually one of the really exciting things about science. Reading science, we know a lot, we don't know everything. Um, and so this evolves over time as it should. We think about translational science process from basic science to implementation at scale. There's research going on across all of that continuum and it will continue. And so what that means is that um, we have to be okay with course corrections. What I mean by this is we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater here, but 
if we're doing a practice um, that we find out, wait, hold on a second. I thought I, I was had really good intent here. I thought that um, I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and then someone, something else comes along and maybe it's a slight change to what I'm doing. We have to be okay with that because ultimately this is about the kids we serve, not about the ego of me our teachers, our administrators, or anyone else. This is about the kids that we serve. So we should be ready for course corrections if with our instructional practices and maybe our assessment practices. Um, we should be open and willing to engage in those conversations. Like these are difficult conversations to have. They're very difficult. I engage in difficult conversations many hours of the week. Um, but they are essential if we're going to be serving children in the way that they ought to be served. So some concluding thoughts, um, we are, at, I think we're at a pivotal moment here, um, both in society, what's going on uh, sort of at a grand scale in the reading science space. I think um, we are many, many more divisions in, in districts and schools and regions are saying, oh wait, we need to pay attention to this. We need to make sure that our, our instruction is evidence-based. Um, but we, but we've been here. It's not that we haven't been here before. So folks in the United States who are as old as me or older will remember reading first. We've been here before, um, and we need to make sure that we're paying attention to what went wrong with reading first and what went right with reading first, because it was not all bad, right? So make sure that we're paying attention to that and doing a better job and really engaging with our communities around how this can be implemented. So we can learn from our past mistakes and the translation of reading science um, as we move forward. And we need to make sure that the work is informing both policy and practice. So again, there it, you can write a beautiful law on literacy and changing literacy practices, but what's really very important is how that's implemented, how it's meshed to teachers and how it's implemented. Um, and it has to be done in collaboration, hand in hand with all education stakeholders. And it, this work requires deep and meaningful collaboration organized around the common goal. The common goal is that we want all children to learn how to read. And one final thing I'll say, um, I think, is that we really need to approach this with humility. So um, because we are serving kids, not ourselves, um, every conversation that you go into with someone around reading science, every time I go into a conversation, um, I go in with good intent and I assume that the person coming to the table, even if I know that their approach is very, very different than mine, I assume they have in good intent as well. And I also know that I don't know everything. Nobody knows everything. And that's why this has to be a collaboration and a, um, a, around team science and implementation with communities because not one person knows everything. And we are talking about the lives of children. So we need to keep that in mind. So I will stop there. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, your lecture has been a reminder of how far we've come and definitely an inspirational wake up call to where our work leads us next. Um, the Winward Institute team has been a longtime admirer of your research and work, and just as importantly, uh, your advocacy efforts, which are truly giving a platform to the people that need to be heard and the topics that need to be addressed. So at the WI, where we work every day to disrupt the educational status quo, we need more people like you and your colleagues to lend their voice to this discussion. So as you noted, we're at a true education exigency and we are hopeful that while seemingly small and slow to see, there will be visible change in our lifetime, which of course will have exponential benefit for those that come after us. Um, so before I go down the path of existentialism and education, um, I would love if you wouldn't mind lending your brain to us for a few more moments. Um, there are some questions that were submitted prior to tonight's event. Some of the inquiries were touched upon in your presentation, but um, we would love for you to discuss even deeper on some of them. So, uh, one is, while we know the key components of a robust and effective reading program, are there benefits to using more than one method or program to teach reading and literacy skills, or is it better to choose one and stick with it? Yeah, I, feel that, I think that's a hard question to answer, honestly. So we know what the, you know, for especially for early literacy development, teaching kids to learn how to read. Um, 
uh, we know what the sort of key ingredients are, explicit systematic instruction, making sure we're making really clear connections between um, letters and sounds and, you know, developing that language structure in, in young children. Um, so, you know, I, so this is my concern about saying use multiple methods. <laughs> it's, I'll just be real honest. Um, sometimes I think that when we implement new approaches in classrooms, um, we don't adequately support teachers in that in the implementation of that particular method. And we get 18 months, two years down the road and we decide it doesn't work. And so um, I would suggest that you need to ensure that whatever method you're doing is aligned with the science, with what we know about how reading develops. And you cannot just hand it off to teachers and expect them um, to, to implement it with fidelity and with, you know, accuracy and, you know, efficiency. So, um, yeah, so I think we do, we, we know the instructional methods that are really important for early literacy instruction, and we need to stick to those, and we need to provide um, teachers with the support on the implementation side. Great, thank you. Yeah, teachers definitely need similar to support that their students do, you know, continual um, reinforcement of skills for certain. Um, just a reminder to um, everyone who is here with us, if your question is not answered, um, we will be sharing the questions um, and responses later on our website along with the recording of tonight's event. So in keeping um, an eye on the time, we will do one more question before we close out. Um, and I have my thoughts on what this might be, but um, if people take away one thing from your presentation tonight, what would you like that to be? That there are multiple levers. <laughs> Two things, multiple levers, and that we all have a really important role in this process. I don't care what you do, like why, there's a reason why you're here listening to reading stuff. So it means you're interested in reading and ensuring that all kids have equitable access to evidence-based literacy instruction. And, um, and we all have an important role to play. And um, I think understand your role, understand where you can push on the levers um, and collaborate the people around you to make sure that you can push on multiple simultaneously. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Annie. Thank you so much for kind of guiding a little Q and A here. Uh, Emily, I so appreciate you being here. There's so many bits of your message that I just find, uh, I find so important. You know, um, one is that this idea of we got to follow the research, not the individual. I think that is that's why those are wise words. Um, I talk a lot about this notion of letting go of our ego in our work, right? Not coming to the table, making it about us, but making it about the kids we serve. And I, I just love that resonates with me so much. I think it resonates with so many folks in our field and our community. I, I also love your messaging around how to not keep piling on for teachers, right? Education is so challenging. I think the professionalism at times is, you know, people, uh, you know, with the way that the, the society teach teachers to, or treats teachers, like that professionalism sometimes gets pulled away from, from some really great educators. They're asked to be social workers, they're asked to be psychologists, they're asked to be nurses, they're asked to be junior epidemiologists now during the pandemic. They, they're asked to do so much in this work. Um, and I think your sort of, you know, your caution around not putting more on their plate because something has to come up. We have to let go of some things. We've got to have some really good prioritized conversations about what's next. And thinking through the idea of how do we bring some good thinking, some good PD, and look for the long game here. And I, you know, I, like you, I have so many conversations of what's the answer? What's the thing I should do tomorrow is going to cure all this? And we know there's not a single sort of thing that you can put into the mixture that's going to cause everything to get magically better tomorrow. What what sort of comes through hard work, great professional development, really having researchers like you step forward in the in the work here to say, I have some I have some expertise and knowledge and let me figure out how to get that into the hands of the people who are capable of doing and making the most change and good with this. So your mission on the translational piece for us is just really critical. Um, I just wanna say thank you for that. 
Um, and I want to say thank you for everybody for being here tonight. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the, the conversation uh, with, with Emily. Um, we do have a, a lecture coming up in the fall. I think it's on October 27th um, for, with, um, with Tiffany Hogan, um, which we hope you're going to join us for. I know um, uh, Emily knows her well. And so we're very, very excited. We've got a great slate of folks coming up. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Again, thank you so much for being here, for supporting Winward, for supporting the Winward Institute. And a big thanks to the WI team for putting this all on. Thank you and good night, folks.